So the next couple of talks I hold pretty near and dear. I think these, these are some of my favorites. I love you know, hearing all this research and, and, and professors come and scientists come and present about things, but in a lot of ways I think it, what makes this conference maybe a little different from the rest is that we get to involve practitioners and ranchers and folks on the ground who are doing the stuff that we're talking about. And I think that's what makes it really valuable. Not just that we can have them here and speak with us, but that we can compare notes uh, over lunch or over break and, and do that little networking thing. I think it's so important, uh, and such an important part of the Restoring the West Conference. Uh, we really try to build in lots of opportunities for you to do that, and we hope you take advantage of that, that time. I'm pleased to present our next speaker, uh, Carol Evans is a fisheries biologist with the Bureau of Land Management in Elko, Nevada. I was told by somebody else to emphasize that Carol has been doing this for more than 25, some even would even claim 30 years, although her, 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 her thing only says 25. Um, and that some of her coworkers in, in combination with them there in Elko, they have more than 60 years of experience doing this kind of work. So we're really pleased to have Carol. Um, and Carol is going to be speaking about managing livestock grazing for riparian recovery in northeastern Nevada. Please welcome Carol Evans. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation to come here. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to be here. So um, I, I did start with BLM in 1988, so I guess that makes about 26 years, Elko District BLM, but I guess the 30 or 35 years that really dates me, but I was working on streams in the late 70s, but I was with the Forest Service at that time. So, so everything that I know about livestock grazing on streams is really a story in progress. Um, so, the, kind of, for, for me to tell this story, I have to go back in time a little bit. And this says the Elko District, our story, but it's my story. And it's probably the story of a lot of, of federal agencies and offices in the West. But basically, I kind of see it like this. Uh, we had a kind of a documentation phase in the 70s, uh, recognition and protection phase, and, and I'm talking about repairing areas, recognition of repairing areas and protection phase. For our district, it was in the mid to... Uh, mid to late 1980s, and then spent an awful lot of time starting probably about the early 1990s for me, learning how to graze repairing areas. Um, and so now, I figure where I'm at now is sort of why watersheds, you know, because, because I'll talk some more about this, but because all these changes that are happening are just phenomenal to me out there, and so I think it's really critical that we need to think at watershed scales now, apply everything we've learned and put it at a watershed scale. So, um, for those of you that aren't baby boomers, um, this is what we looked like in the 1970s. <laughs> so, but uh, the, the interesting guy aside, um, so I call this the documentation phase. And for the Elko District, we had this um, pretty incredible stream survey effort that was started by this uh, one individual. He's uh, recently retired, but he put these baseline stream surveys, collected data and set transects, and most importantly, took photographs on all the, all the perennial streams on the whole Elko District. And so that was like about 1,000 miles of stream. But the, the key thing here is that if you pull out any of these old notebooks that we have, every single one of the streams looked like this in the late 70s. They, they were all in really poor condition. So um, we kind of got into this, and a lot of places did, I call the protection phase, and that's when we built all these little exposures around riparian areas. So the thing with those was, you know, no, no grazing and a lot of grazing, and it was one or the other with little fences in between. So, um, you know, those were important because they, they gave people a chance to see what riparian areas could do without being grazed all the time. So they had a, a valuable role. But honestly, all the little ones that we built all over the 12 million acres or so in the Elko District after 30 years or so, they're kind of an unmitigated disaster, honestly. Um, usually the insides look like the outsides. Usually the fence are, fences are down. And two, you know, I, I heard a hydrologist tell me I've never seen a stream not connected to its watershed. And so the problem there was, you know, if you didn't control all the watershedding from a degraded watershed, you got things like head cuts right up through the exclosures. So there's probably a better way to do things. And 
many of you know Wayne Elmore kind of started this concept or this movement and uh, our National Riparian Service team has really, really done a lot of work. Um, creeks and communities, um, Sherm um, <clears throat> Swanson now the University of Nevada is just, has been so, uh, such an advocate for, for teaching this. But, but basically, you know, how do we make the outside uh, look like the inside of an exposure or a fenced area through prescriptive grazing? So, you know, we've been doing that a lot for a lot of years on the Elko District and I'm just putting a list here of some stuff that works. Um, there's, there's a ton of different ways to do it, but these are just some examples of some su successes and when I say something like fall slash spring rest, what I mean is maybe it's grazed one year in the fall, an area, the next year in the spring, and the next year it's rested. So lots of different combinations to get repair and recovery through prescriptive grazing. So um, just a few examples on the ground of, of what that looks like. Um, Dixie Creek, picture taken in 1989. So that's just with an early grazing treatment after about four years. You can see the recovery, a narrower, deeper channel and a functional floodplain. Um, so this is a, there's another one of those guys from the 70s. This picture was taken in the late 1970s. This is Coyote Creek, um, has cutthroat trout. It's in the Maggie Creek Basin, and I'm going to talk more about Maggie Creek, so if you kind of keep a mental track of some of these streams in the Maggie Basin. Um, so this is your typical degraded streams in our stream survey database in the 1970s when cows were there basically from April till October, November every year. So working with um, Newmont Mining Corporation, who owns the TS Ranch, we, we changed, changed things around, had an initial period of rest, and then... Uh, the cow-calf pairs come in from April till um, July or so every other year, and it's rested every other year. So a lot of dramatic improvement. That's 2010. Um, so this is, a, this is one of the first stream surveys I did <laughs> when I was a new young biologist working for Elko District in um, May of 1988. Took this picture on a drainage called Beaver, Beaver Creek. Also has cutthroat, also in the Maggie Creek Basin. And I remember thinking, wow, this would be a really cool... Uh, before slide, you know, in a slideshow some days. So, so it was, and um, this is, I just took this a couple weeks ago, and this is a project with a, a 20, 25 ranch, um, uh, 25, 26 corporation, 25 corporation they're called. Um, so this has just been a system. There was some rest. There's uh, yearlings or cow, calf pairs, and they graze it during the hot season some years, but there's other years of early season grazing or rest. So we just kind of mix things up. So this is a project that I, I, I really like because um, th this solved more than just the repairing project. This one also looked at the uplands, but this is a North Fork of the Humboldt River, another one of those 70s pictures. So we built a big kind of a, a big repairing pasture. Um, there's about eight miles of stream total in this, but we also put a pipeline system on the uplands. So um, this, this gets grazed, at the sheep and cattle come in spring or fall. So. Um, just another example, East Fork of Beaver Creek, your typical, this was 85, um, so we did have some pictures of degraded conditions uh, really all the way up to the 90s, but season long grazing, hot season grazing. This system um, has a, let's see, it's got uh, cow-calf pairs, um, two out of three years where they graze, they, they leave by about the end of June, end of July, and then that third year they graze July to September, which is a tough hot season treatment, but but the good years are getting ahead of the bad year here. So just uh, another example, this is also from the Maggie Creek Basin, a place called Indian Jack Creek. This is 92, typical season long grazing shot. Um, changed it up, working with the mine and the TS Ranch. Uh, had some rest, had, has cows there till about uh, mid-June for two years in a row, and then the third year is a year of rest. So, but, but the point here is typical early recovery, but but what's important is the willows are starting to get going. And so when we have a big flood event, those willows are really capturing a lot of alluvial material, which you know makes way for a lot of willow growth and some of the changes that you see here. There, I don't know if you saw the cage in the prior photographs. There it is there, but there's a pretty good channel there. And cutthroat have actually found their way into this stream from the neighboring Maggie Creek. So, um, but <laughs> learned a few things too, learned, made a lot of mistakes. So. Here's another picture of the North Fork, the Humboldt River, taken in the 70s, and we, is an early grazing treatment only, um, so the river looks really good. This is 2004, but 
you know, we kind of killed the uplands. And um, so the lesson, you know, riparian, early grazing works great in riparian areas, but not such a good thing for your uplands. So, you know, turn the uplands into uh, weeds and rabbit brush and sagebrush. And so really, I, I think uh, grazing the same way every year is a really bad thing to do. You need to focus pressure on different plant communities and in different parts of the landscape and different times of the year. So, and the other big lesson for me, and especially with uh, all the change that's going on in the environment, is that these systems really need to be adaptive. Um, the streams are, the environment's really changing, and the way that the stream reacts to this changing environment is just all over the board, depending on what's happening. And I think the old model of the grazing plans that we had, where we had set schedules, they, I just don't think they work very well in this new, new world that we live in. So as an example, um, this is the South Fork of the Little Humboldt River, has cutthroat. This picture was actually from 99, before any changes were made. So we changed to a system of, uh, of rest and then fall and spring grazing. And so that's a really recovery. But here's the thing that was really going crazy all over our district is, and, and I'm interested if other people have observed this too, but particularly where we've had better management, starting in about 2003, but I really saw it take off, I think in about 2008, beaver have just come to occupy everything, everywhere. So, you know, being adaptive, it, you know, the environment is really changing. So the grazing prescription that we needed early on when it was so degraded is probably a lot different now when it looks like this. But I will say too, I, this picture was 2011 and I'll be back here next week and with this drought, I have expect to see this mostly dry. And, and so the beaver impact there, they've probably, you know, they've drowned some of the willows, they took some of the mature willows, so the site's gonna be vulnerable again. So we're back to, you know, be careful with the grazing here if it dried out. So another, another my favorite place is, uh, one of my favorite places is Susie Creek. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that later too, but Susie Creek in 91, we started with a uh, hot season only grazing, <laughs> moved to um, uh, spring fall riparian pasture. So typical early recovery looks like this. And if I had set objectives, I used to do this. I used to say, you know, improve the width of depth ratio and increase willows and do all these things. But over time, the site just changes in places. I don't know where it's going. So the beaver came in. You might notice um, the watershed burned. There was sagebrush originally. Their watershed burned. That's happening all over the place. Um, but that was 2008. So this was 2012. So already this is changing so fast. The, the beaver dams, um, in a lot of cases, are making way to cattail marshes almost. So this was 2012, and I went out there this summer, and that's all, it's transitioning again to something else. It's more of a meadow type, so will it be a single thread channel and a productive meadow? I, I don't know, but clearly the grazing that we started with, the prescription, clearly, you know, we could, we could use a different prescription on this very changing environment, so. Um, so I, you know, I don't want to go through all the detail on this, but, but the way I look at all this with grazing over time is take a long-term view of it. And basically, I think if you have more things that are good for riparian areas than things that are bad for riparian areas, you'll get recovery. If you have more, more good in the system, you're going to get recovery faster. If you have uh, quite a bit of bad in the system, it's going to be slower. Um, but you know, good things are, are, are things like you know, early grazing, winter grazing, um, regrowth movement, getting water, riding, herding supplements, lighter <coughs> use, rotating seasons of use. There's all kinds of things. There's all kinds of ways to graze riparian areas. And of course, bad is basically the pressure just stays there. It's, it's cows all summer long without any change. So, um, so I, like, I like to say, I like some of these, this way of looking at it. Um, Greg Simons, who, who is here in Utah with Open Range Consulting, and I mentioned Dr. Sherm Jensen out of University of Nevada, Reno. They, they really shaped my thinking about a lot of this, and, and this is how they would describe it. You just, um, rather than looking at impacts in management, you know, just look at where you can introduce recovery, and it can be recovery for just part of a season, but, you know, interject recovery into the system. So, and this is a really super important lesson. It can't be too complicated. Um, Mary O'Brien is here, and I remember something she said a couple years ago when she came to look at some of these projects in Elko. She said, keep it fle flexible, simple, and accountable, and I, I think that's really good advice. Um, so, so, you know, all these things, you know, over time you learn and, and time to take in all these things, and so now I feel like um, it's so critical to apply all this at a watershed, at a watershed scale. In fact, I think it's essential. 
Um, you know, I've always been interested in management because I'm a fisheries biologist, so, you know, streams don't stop at a pasture line. So I've always been interested in watersheds and interconnected streams and channels and things. But, um, but a few, you know, things, some trends that I've seen over the last few years have really made me think about trying to apply this at watershed scales. So um, one of them is fire. So, you know, we've had a heck of a lot of fires in northeastern Nevada, and I know that's true in other places. But particularly after the 2006 fires, I could really see that, um, that how a riparian area responded to a fire was all about grazing. It was about the grazing system before the fire, and once the rest closure time was lifted, it was about the grazing season system after. So, I mean, these areas not only, not only could they stop wildfires, and they did a lot if they're healthy, um, they just, they weren't hurt very much by fires. Um, so one of Sherm um, Swanson's graduate students out of the University of Nevada looked at some of this. He looked at some of our, some of the data from our older fires, but using a lot of the stream survey database that we had and, and some other districts had, um, he found the same thing, at least they quantified it really well, um, the same thing that I, she, I should say, it's Beldorf, is she, excuse me. Um, the same thing that I feel like I'm seeing. So, and it says, you know, the occurrence of wildfire during the 91, 2001 fire seasons played a non-influential role in the response of selected stream survey attributes when coupled with livestock grazing attributes. So, so it was neat to see some research um, kind of verifying what I thought I was seeing in the field. So, um, so the other thing, and I mentioned it before, was, was the beaver thing. And, uh, that really caught my attention and until recently. Now I'm thinking with this severe drought, I'm, I'm thinking they're declining. But um, there was a period there, like I said, starting in about 2003, up until recently, where beaver are just everywhere. And, and is it because the populations are up, because trapping's down? Probably, maybe. But I also think it's because we have a lot better management in some of these areas. And they can, they can inhabit these areas now. So that was really changing watersheds on a big scale. So. And then now, now my attention, the drought has really caught my attention. So, you know, I've, since I've been working on streams since the late 70s, 70s, I have not seen anything like this. Um, the severity of this drought and its impact on these systems. But, but the one thing that really stands out is uh, areas that don't have good management, we're just, they're dying. We're just killing them. There's nothing there. And uh, areas that have good management, they're, they're holding on. I, I don't know how... How, they, how much longer they can persist, but right now, in three years of severe drought and no runoff, they're holding on. So, so anyhow, I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about taking some of these thoughts where we have applied them to watershed levels, a watershed scale over time, and just show you some of the, the amazing results and why I think that is so critical to be doing this at watershed scales. So I just used two examples that I've been um, very involved with for 20 some years. Both of these efforts started in the early 90s. One is in the Maggie Creek Basin and it's about pretty good size area, about 400 square miles. And the other neighboring uh, watershed is the Susie Creek Basin. It's about 200 square miles. Um, the interest in this, particularly in Maggie Creek, was because this has a meta population of cutthroat trout. Lahontan cutthroat trout are federally listed species. So there was a lot of interest. And then Susie Creek is, is potential reintroduction habitat. So, so the fisheries uh, values here kind of drove the interest. But you will notice how much um, private land is in these watersheds. The white is private and the yellow is public. There's a lot of private land. And it took a, there's been a lot of partners. We have all kinds of partners, um, federal agencies, state agencies. Um, the mines have a lot going on in this area, and they're very involved. And, and and certainly, the, probably the most important players are the, the livestock permittees. So, so with all this going on, um, it's given me a chance to kind of kind of look at these changes on a big scale over a long period of time. So this is a picture of Maggie Creek taken in 1980 on the ground, and it looked like that until the early 90s when we started changing things. So that's the same location in 2011. Lots of wetlands and lots of beaver dams coming in. Um, just another picture, if you turned right around and looked downstream, it would look like that. Um, and then you saw some of the tributaries, too, earlier on. You could see some of the changes on some of the smaller systems. Um, so um, Greg Simons and his colleague Eric Sant, who's here somewhere in the audience, um, they, were, they were really interested in um, not only in applying prescriptive grazing at big scales, but also what's an easy and efficient way to capture the story of that. And so 
they're really interested in using remote sensing techniques to do this. So Greg approached me about working in the Maggie Creek watershed um, back about probably eight or nine years ago because he knew that we had all this change and we had a lot of data on the ground. So um, we did, we did uh, embark on a partnership with him and also involved the mines and the TS Ranch. Um, but he, he and his colleagues, he and Eric Sant, um, kind of came up with a technique whoops, of kind of um, defining where a potential riparian area is and then watching how that filled in over time using remote sensing techniques. So this is from the Maggie Basin on Maggie Creek. This was 1994, and this is a picture from 2006. And just in this part of the basin, they showed an increase of over 800 acres in riparian vegetation within that area that it could potentially expand. So, so we, we've continued on with this, and we recently um, issued a contract to Sherm Jensen with Whitehorse Associates here in Logan, and he's, he's done just phenomenal work too. And he, but he looked at an even bigger scale at the whole Maggie Creek watershed, and he, he, there's all kinds of really neat metrics that are showing the changes here, but I like this slide because this, oops, um, this shows the, the effect of the beaver dams at a big scale. So he, the metric here is ponded water. So this was 2006, and just four years later, by 2010, there was, there was an increase in nine miles of this ponded water. So that, that's a huge water addition to the watershed. Um, he had some other, he has a lot, of, there's a lot of metrics. I just pulled out a couple that were interesting. Um, stream bars decreasing, uh, this mix of riparian water increasing, the amount of marshy stuff was increasing, the length of the, the stream with a combination of water and marsh increased by seven miles. Um, but I wanted to kind of focus on this last one, this transition acres, and that increased in this area by, by almost 800 acres. And transition, I think, is really interesting because this is a picture from Maggie Creek area, and so what was formerly a gravel bar was sagebrush and rabbit brush is, is rapidly rehydrating and and starting to pick up a lot more mesic species. And this is actually a picture from Susie Creek, and the same thing is happening, but this wet zone is moving out toward the terraces. And I'm especially intrigued with that because, um, you know, with all the, all the information going on and interest in sage grouse, these, these metric uh, mesic areas, you know, are bringing these mesic forbs out with them further and further. So I, I can't help but think that that's a really important to sage grouse for summer broods. Um, so, the Maggie Basin is uh, down at the southern end of the basin. There's a huge gold mine, and there's a lot of dewatering going on. So, by Newmont Mining Corporation, and also Barrick on the other side of the mountain. But the the mines have a pretty extensive system of, of groundwater monitoring wells scattered up and down the Susie and Maggie Creek basins. So, it was kind of neat. One of these uh, monitoring a shallow monitoring well right next to uh, Maggie Creek. Kind of, we started looking at this, and, and the purpose was to track dewatering, which, which hasn't made it up to this area, but we started to see something else that was really interesting. Um, so what this shows, back here in the early 90, 90, 93, 94 is when we started the restoration, takes us up to about present. Um, so there was a lot of volatility in the, in the water level in this shallow aquifer. Um, and, and then slowly, as the restoration took place, whether it was aggradation or beaver dam storage, we just started to see more and more um, storage and probably less volatility and here we are in this severe severe drought and you can see some dips but it's still functioning a couple feet higher than when we first started so so another interesting thing that came out of some of the mine monitoring had to do with water quality and this is a graph um, total suspended sediments tons per day on the left and um, flows on the right and so in in, in 2005, we had a flow of 600 CFS, and a comparable flow to that time period happened in 1993 at the beginning of the restoration efforts. So under the same flow conditions but different habitat conditions, they were picking up about 8,000, yeah, let's see, 600 CFS. Yeah, about 8,000 um, total, total suspended sediment tons per day. And under a similar flow, after many years of restoration, only picking up about 800 um, TSS, total, total suspended sediment tons per day. So that was a, a huge change in the amount of sediment being discharged out of that system. Instead, it's being captured and used in the system for floodplains. So this is just an aerial picture of the Maggie Creek Basin I took from a helicopter in April of uh, 20, 2012. 
and just show some of these concepts at work. We had no runoff that year, none at all, but uh, you can just see the amount of water storage that's going on in here. Um, you can see too, you know, these old side channels. This is probably the transition area in here. The whole, the whole thing's just getting a lot more hydrated. If you walk down on all these old depressions and channels, they're starting to fill up with forbs. Um, and then I talked about fire too. Here's a great example of how uh, healthy riparian areas stopped a fire. That was a fire in 2007 right there. So, so I wanted to say a few things about the other uh, watershed, Suzy Creek, um, the smaller watershed. So that's been really fun and really interesting too. So here's a picture where we started in 92 on Suzy Creek, pretty degraded, season-long grazing with cattle. And as I mentioned earlier, we changed it up to uh, spring and fall use only. Started to change, this was um, 96. Um, and so this was 2012, but this just shows the magnitude of the beaver downs and the water storage and the wetlands that are being created on a, on a huge scale. There's about 20 miles of this. So, you know, if you look at this from an aerial photograph view, there, there's a picture of 91, and then this is um, 2011 in, on the upper part. That whole wide area, which you're looking at probably, oh, probably three or 400 feet of width that, between those old gully walls and that floodplain, it's just filled up with all these beaver dams and riparian vegetation. So it's really kind of acting like a, a storage dam, I think. So, so there's some mine, um, there's some monitoring wells in this basin also. So here's one next to Susie Creek. It's pretty close to the stream. Um, in this picture, that's about right there. This picture was taken in 2013 during the second year of our severe drought. And this is recovery in beaver dams in a severe drought. Um, but, but this is a, a re, uh, another graph straight out of the mine report. So there's a few things on here that are, don't pertain. Um, but there's a few anomalies in the data and there's other wells. But the well of interest is this SC1, which is the one in the picture I showed you. And, and the same sort of trend is happening here. Um, we're storing a lot more water and, and we're even doing it in the face of this severe drought. So, over time, so. Um, and so for me, because I'm a biologist, the neatest thing um, has just been watching the amount of wildlife that's come into these areas um, and just how important that is as everything dries up. Um, sandhill cranes nesting, a couple pairs. I, I just can imagine sandhill cranes being there um, 15 or 20 years ago. There's terns, there's muskrats, there's beaver, there's mink, there's uh, um, white-faced ibis, there's uh, just shorebirds, there's waterfowl. Um, a lot of mule deer production too is going on in these areas. So tremendous wildlife value. And uh, you know, the, in these drought conditions, boy, the wildlife is just, just sucked into these areas that still have these values. So, and then the rancher too, this is, um, John Griggs with Maggie Creek Ranch, he, he really appreciates having this because at the end of the season when he weans the cows, he has a place to put his cows in. When it's a stressful time, it's a place where they can settle down and start to gain weight. So it's really, he, he's, he's very much sold on this sort of a prescription. So um, before I leave the streams here, I just want to say that, you know, this, this drought is, is kind of blowing me away. I've told you that, but, but, but the importance of the beaver dams holding water for wildlife and for for everything is just it's it's been phenomenal that's the places where the fish have survived and where the wildlife's had water is just you know it's where we had restoration where the beaver came in and now the beaver holding the water it's really been i've really seen it come to life okay so um i'm just about i'm done here but uh i wouldn't be telling you the truth if i didn't tell you you know we we can go from here to here to here fortunately we're back here but this stuff happens all the time and uh there's a, there's a long list of reasons. Um, agencies struggle. I don't think it's money or politics. I think it's, it, I think it's some of these other issues. Um, but you know, in terms of solutions, this is a picture of Pat Coffin who worked on these streams for uh, 52 years. And besides banging our head against the wall, um, I think a lot of the solutions will come from, from the private sector, from um, conservation groups, Trout Unlimited has been a huge partner, the ranchers themselves, the public land, the private lands programs, there's just a lot of interest and, and drive being generated from that sector of all this. And I have the, the perfect ending slide here because the next speaker is A.G. Smith, and that's him right there, and uh, he's, he's really where the rubber hits the road, and he's going to tell you how he's taken all these things, all, all this, and put it into a put it into application on the ground. AG, agency, AG is a permittee on, on the Elko BLM district. So, okay, with that, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. oh, let's see, I, uh, 
It's hard for me. To, I get up in the back with the red shirt. Okay. Yeah, the question was about tamarix, and I don't see very much, but on the Susie Creek, I'm seeing a couple plants. I think it's waiting in the wings out there for us. Scary. Yeah. Okay, right there. Uh huh. Yes, yeah. Right. Yeah, the question is, I guess, about how do you implement this on a practical scale without building a lot of fences? And, uh, you know, the small fences are really problematic, but I think to put this on a big scale, you do have to have some control. There are places where you've got to put some fencing in at a big kind of a watershed scale, but there's, there's writing techniques, there's salting techniques, there's supplemental feeding, there's water distribution. There's just a lot of ways to do it, and, it, and usually the way to do it is a combination of a whole bunch of different things that depends on uh, the capacity and the allotment and the people involved in the private land and alternate pastures and e each each solution is is really site specific. So. Last question for Carol. You been to the uh, Number Eighty Mountains over the three decades? Yeah, there's been a big drop in rain. There hasn't been any. There hasn't. <laughs>